Amen. Please be seated. What is the most important thing that has happened in your life? A time or an experience maybe that you will carry with you for all of your days. Maybe it was the night you fell in love with your best friend and stayed up talking late into the night. Love you, Megan. Maybe it was the day your first child was born. Maybe it was the day four years ago when you decided to get sober and it finally stuck. Maybe it was something sad. Maybe it was the day your dad died. Maybe it was the day of your wedding or your divorce or the day you graduated or the day you landed that dream job you always wanted. Maybe it was the first time that you prayed to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Or maybe it was a, a mountaintop experience like we heard about in our readings. What was the most important event or time in your life? The Apostle Peter had a rich and varied life, what you might call a full life. He lived a very full life. He had a wife and family. He was a fisherman with a fleet of fishing vessels under his command. He was a salty and seasoned sailor. Peter watched as Jesus healed people, cast out demons, even watched as Jesus raised people from the dead. He saw him calm a violent storm with a word and walk on water. In fact, Peter himself walked on water with Jesus. He heard the sermon on the mount with his own ears. He participated in the feeding of the 5,000. He saw Jesus get beaten and eventually crucified. He, he saw Jesus with his own eyes risen from the dead. Peter talked with angels and men, kings and beggars. He saw the Holy Spirit fall in flames on the day of Pentecost and preached to thousands. He personally baptized hundreds of people. He healed a lame man. Peter had a full life with many experiences, many things that if we just had one of them, we would carry with us all our days. And I'm sure he carried many of these memories with him for all the days of his life. But at the end of it all, there is one thing he always remembered. There was one thing that he wanted to leave behind as his legacy. At the end of his life, Peter wrote these words. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. What is it? What is it that Peter wants them to remember before he dies? He continues, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. We saw his glory. We heard the voice of the Lord speaking with our own ears. We were with Jesus on the mountain. Peter's mountaintop experience with Jesus is what he returns to at the end of his life. Not the miracles, not the teaching, not even the crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. The event that Peter goes back to is the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain the first time he really saw Jesus in all of his glory. The pinnacle of his life was that mountaintop. Why? Why is the Mount of Transfiguration where Peter returns to at the end of his life? And how does that event help us discover what really matters in our lives, what's really important? Jesus 
is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, everything in between. What Peter saw on the mountain is everything that's worth seeing in this life. For Peter, to see Jesus is to see the past, the present, and the future. Let me explain what I mean. First, the past. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter sees the fulfillment of what he and every other Jew were waiting for. Listen to how the Gospel of Mark describes what Peter, James, and John saw in their mountaintop experience. Jesus was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. So the disciples are seeing Jesus in all his glory, his clothes are blinding, and they're astonished at this display, and Peter says, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. That might be the understatement of the century. But after they recover from their initial shock, they notice that Jesus is not alone. There are two other people. You go on to read, there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now, I don't need to remind you, Moses by this point had been dead for quite some time. And Elijah, quite some time ago, had been taken up into heaven. But here they are, hanging out with Jesus on the mountaintop. Moses, the giver of the law, and Elijah, the chief prophet of the Old Testament. They're talking with Jesus. These two men symbolize and would have meant for, for the disciples up on that mountaintop, the two halves of the Old Testament, of their holy scriptures, their holy writings, the law, the Torah, and the prophets. These two halves pointing to Jesus. In the law, the Torah, Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. What did the voice say? This is my son. Listen to him. To whom? To him you shall listen. The law promised that one day there would be a prophet like Moses who would come and lead God's people to freedom, just like Moses had led them to freedom from captivity. And then Elijah, the prophets, the second half of the Old Testament, promised that one day, you see this all throughout the prophetic tradition, one day God himself would come and dwell with his people would be with his people. The appearance of Moses and Elijah while Jesus is transfigured is, is this sign from the past that these promises are being fulfilled. It's this clear signpost saying, this is happening now. Here's Moses. Here's Elijah. They're with Jesus, and he's glowing. <laughs> Wake up. Jesus is the prophet like Moses. Jesus is God himself dwelling with his people. And so Peter saw these past promises of God being fulfilled in the person of Jesus. He saw the whole history of the Jews coming finally to fulfillment. And I think for us, we need the same thing that Peter and James and John did, right? Our stories, our lives are, are sort of uh, can feel disconnected until we're able to put them in a larger story, a bigger story, one that goes all the way back and stretches back even to the creation of the world. The past is coming to fruition. All these promises of God are coming to be fulfilled. And we need to know that we're part of that bigger story that started long before us and will continue, presumably, long after us. The presence of Moses and Elijah says that the past matters. The past matters. The past is leading up to something. It's leading us somewhere. But it also signals something about the present. So second, present. The Mount of Transfiguration also stuck with Peter for his whole life because of when this mountaintop experience occurred. Right before this, Jesus has told them that he's going to die, that they're heading to Jerusalem for him to be crucified. Jesus took, him, took them up onto the mountain right smack dab in the middle of the gospel. This is, this is the central, the centerpiece of the whole gospel of Mark. In fact, when we zoom out and look at the context of all these different mountaintop experiences, it seems like mountaintops seem to occur right smack dab in the middle of things, right at the midpoint. 
Take Elijah's mountaintop experience, for example. Elijah, as we read in our Old Testament, is on Mount Horeb because he's on the run from Jezebel and Ahab. Elijah has just had this epic showdown with the prophets of Baal, where he slaughtered 450 of Jezebel's prophets. Jezebel's not very happy about this, so she tries to kill him. And so she's got all of her her goons going out trying to find Elijah to put him to death. And so Elijah runs away. He runs for 40 days and 40 nights. He's on the run. And he makes it finally to Horeb, which is called the mountain of God. Mount Horeb is also the mountain where Moses first encountered the Lord in the burning bush. And again, where Moses receives the Ten Commandments from the Lord. In other words, the two times when Moses was gearing up to do the hardest things he would ever do in his life, deliver God's people out of Egypt and lead them in the desert for 40 years, that's when God appears on the mountaintop, right before those very difficult, trying circumstances. I can only assume that Elijah didn't realize this history of Mount Horeb, or else he probably would have chosen a different mountain to flee to, one that maybe had an easier history. And so when, when Peter, James, and John, when they're brought up into a mount, onto this mountain, and they see Elijah and Moses, they would have immediately connected those dots. We're up on a mountain. Elijah and Moses are here. God is meeting with us. Jesus is glowing. There is something very difficult coming. There's something very hard coming. No wonder that Peter wants to stay on the mountaintop and build some huts. Right? Wouldn't you? That's why he says, Rabbi, it's good that we are here, not down there. Better to be here. Let's make some houses and stay. This is a good place to be. I'm joking a little bit. But he was probably... You know, also just wanting to soak in the gloriousness of that moment. I, um, I don't agree with John Piper on everything. That might not be surprising to any of you. But I do agree with him and when he identifies himself as a Christian hedonist. A Christian hedonist. Let me explain what that term means. Christian hedonism is the conviction that God's ultimate goal in this world and our deepest desire are one and the same. Because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That God is glorified when we take satisfaction in him. It's it's what was said in Psalm 27. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever and gaze on his beauty. That when we're satisfied in the Lord, it, it glorifies him. Peter is totally satisfied on that mountain. I think that's why he wants to stay there. He's totally fulfilled. He says, it's good to be here. Let's build some huts. Are you satisfied in your present circumstances? Are you longing for complete satisfaction? To be totally satisfied like Peter was. Peter is brought into the inner sanctuary of God's presence where where God's power is surrounding him, where he is totally safe and secure. And once inside, when he's in that protected space, they discover the same thing that Elijah discovered, the gentleness of God, the still small voice, the low whisper where God speaks intimately with his servants. God's presence is powerful. when When we get close to God, when we see God, when we draw close to him, we discover that he's a gentle shepherd. When we draw close to God, we discover that he's not the rushing wind or the blazing fire. He's a, he's a quiet whisper. Think about the circumstances of the disciples on this mountain with Jesus. This ragtag bunch of disciples are going straight into a showdown with the most powerful forces that they knew. They know that they're going to go to Jerusalem and go up against the Jewish king, the Jewish high priesthood, the leaders of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the whole weight and force of the Roman Empire. Bit intimidating. So they need to know that God is powerful. They need to know that he is strong 
to protect them. We all want that. We need to know that God is strong enough to protect us, whatever challenges we are facing in our present moment. When we're stripped down and laid bare, we need to know that we can come close to God. He will protect us. His power will surround us. We need God for our present circumstances, just like Peter and James and John did. Third, the future. Peter gets to see his future on the Mount of Transfiguration. What do I mean by that? Well, Moses, after his mountain experience on Horeb, never got to enter the Promised Land. Elijah never, ever got to have a faithful king of Israel, one that was really, truly faithful, which is what he longed for. But they received something far greater. The reward for Moses and Elijah was Jesus. Moses gets to meet the full promise of God, not just the promised land. Elijah gets to meet the faithful king of Israel, not just these unfaithful kings of his day. Because when they see Jesus, they realize it's been fulfilled. My whole life's work, my whole life's longing, everything I long for in this life and I didn't get to see, here it is. Here is the promised one. Here is the king that I wished had been here instead of Ahab. And Jesus is our reward as well. He's our future. The reward of the mountaintop isn't an experience with God. It's the person who's waiting for us at the top of the mountain. There's a wonderful line in the Eucharistic prayer. There's some Sundays when I'm trying to say it and you'll notice I get a like, little catch in my voice. It's not because I forgot to swallow my spit or something like that. Um, I do have emotions. But it's so beautiful. I just, it catches me right in the throat every time I try to say it. We say, and bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. Where we shall see the Lord face to face. Peter knew that his future was the future of Moses and Elijah. What they were doing on the mountain, he would spend eternity doing. He was seeing a vision of what eternity is. It's, it's being in the full and glorious presence of Jesus, looking him face to face, conversing with him intimately. They were talking with him, conversing with God. This was Peter's future, and it's ours if we believe in Jesus. Not floating around on clouds, plucking at harps, but looking the God of the universe in the face and conversing with him intimately, spending eternity with him. If you've met Jesus in this life, if you've known him in this life, you will know him for all eternity. There's nothing greater. At the end of your life, what will be your greatest memory? What will you carry with you from this life? What do you want to pass to the next generation? The greatest thing we can experience in this life, the, the greatest ambition that we could have for the generations that come after us is that they would know the living God, that they would know Jesus. The goal of all of our lives, whether you're Christian or not, is to know Jesus is to meet Jesus. Maybe this morning you're sitting here thinking, I have never met Jesus. I don't know Jesus. That's okay. There is no shame in that whatsoever. I want to encourage you. Everyone who seeks, finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. And in fact, Jesus even takes it a step further. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, in to him and eat with him and he with me. God wants to meet with you. He's, he's not somewhere that you have to go seek him out and find him. He's seeking you out. He's longing to be with you. In a couple weeks, we're going to have a Lenten quiet day. And if you've never had a chance to just say, you know what, Lord, I am going to just come and seek you. I want to know your voice. I want to meet with you. We're going to have a quiet day as we start Lent. Uh, on a Saturday for a few hours where you can just come and sit and seek the Lord. Now, there's some of you here this morning and you've experienced the presence of the Lord. You know what it's like and you know that there's nothing else like it. 
you've been in that place. I want to commend this prayer to you. It's from Psalm 51. Restore to me the joy of my salvation, of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. We so quickly forget, don't we? Peter remembered all the way to the ends of his life that he belonged to Jesus and that Jesus belonged to him, that he had met the Lord. In just a moment, I'm going to baptize Liv Marin. And after I baptize her this morning, the first thing that I will do is I'm going to trace the sign of the cross on her forehead with oil. When she grows up and comes to put her faith in Jesus, the bishop will come and he's going to trace that same cross with oil on her forehead. And then eventually, on the day that she dies, a priest will come, hopefully not me, and trace a cross with oil on her forehead. From beginning to end, from beginning to end, it's all about Jesus. She is being marked and claimed as belonging to Jesus from beginning to end. Today, all the things we're going to pray for her and say over her can really be summed up like this. We want Liv Marin to meet and know Jesus. We want her to meet and know Jesus in this life. To see him for who he really is, to encounter the living God. That's what we want for her. That's what Peter wanted for those he was writing his last words to. He said, I want you to meet the living Jesus the way that I have. That's what I want as your pastor for all of you. I want you to meet Jesus. I don't care if you like me. (laughs) Like Jesus. He loves you. I want you to meet Jesus. Whatever challenges you face, wherever you're at this morning, come to the mountain. See Jesus for who he really is. We're starting the season of Lent. This is a time to focus on meeting with Jesus. Make it a priority. Meet with the living God. There's nothing more important. My prayer that I'll be praying for each of you, all Lent, is that you will meet with Jesus, that you will see him for who he is. Amen.